further for those that have been waiting. So, yeah, I'm happy to get started. Thank you, everyone. What an honor to be here. What a beautiful day. It's gorgeous out. It's a perfect day for this. Uh, first thing, I just want to make sure, am I echoing? Are you guys hearing me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. I have two um, videos set up because I'm going to be doing the artwork piece, but you guys can hear me fine. It's just me that's hearing the echo. All right, good. I think so. You're good on my end, too. Okay, great. All right. Well, uh, again, uh, just a, a great day to be here. Uh, feeling really, really privileged to be here. My name is Rodolfo Serna. My spirit name is Inyan Luta, which is Redstone. But my friends call me Rudy Good Smile. Uh, I'm lucky to be here with y'all today uh, to be able to share traditional art culture in a way that has become uh, a healing of sorts. Uh, we're going to be talking about intergenerational trauma. We're going to be talking about the impacts, but also about the ways we've survived our resilience, our strength and courage through storytelling and art. So um, with that said, before, you know, at one point, people didn't really care about who were the people that were here originally. And thank goodness for the young people because things are changing and we started doing this thing where we do a land acknowledgement, a land acknowledgement now before we start events. And I'm going to have one of the um, mentors, one of the uh, students read the land acknowledgement for us now. Okay. Uh, sorry if I butcher some of the names, but what we now call the greater Portland area were the traditional lands of the Motama. Uh, Kalima, Clackamas, Kaulitz, Band of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapa, Malama, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia River. So I just, uh, for some of us that are into the language and the the education piece, it's the Multnomah, the, and I'm butchering it as well. I'm coming from an academia, which is never even the same. Kalamit, uh, Clackamas, Cowlitz, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Molala, and um, these are the tribes of the local area, but we stop to acknowledge them, and the recognition is something that hadn't been done before, but it's an attempt to give that ownership to these lands back to the original people. And for us as people coming from um, other places, from down south, from the islands, but still part of the Americas, uh, this is also our home. And I say that through our roots, through our heritage, because our ancestors were here, even in Oregon. Uh, people will be thinking, what were the Mexican Indians doing in Oregon? Uh, there's stories that go with that. And so I ask our people that, you know, we, we look at our skin and, and we don't look blonde hair, blue eyed, but we resemble the lands from this part of the world. And because of that, we have a special relationship and I wouldn't say ownership, but in fact, it owns us, but responsibility to these lands, but it ties us to, to these lands. And so it's really important for us as immigrants, that's the new word for us, undocumented, things like that. At one point, we were the original people of these lands and we have to create a reframe. That means instead of looking at ourselves as the outsiders, aliens, remind them that our ancestors were here for hundreds of years, thousands of years. And if anything, they're the illegal aliens. So that's a reframe for us as well. It's a lesson for everyone and it's a, a great thing to do whenever you get to be able to be part of big events like this, try to throw it in there. Hey, let's do a land acknowledgement. The ancestors will appreciate it. All right, next frame. Um, actually, before we get started with that, can you turn off the PowerPoint? Whoa, look at all those faces. Look at all those names. Oh, wow. that's fantastic. Where, where's everybody? <laughs> <laughs> Most people are in Vancouver, right, everybody? 
You guys want to put in the chat where you're from? I want to see real quick. Wow. They said the numbers were in the digits. I didn't know we were going to have this many people. Thank you all for being here. This is fantastic. Oh, look at that. Yeah, mostly Vancouver, Battleground. All right. Vancouver's 360. I like that. All right. Yeah, that's that area. That's my second home. Love it. Love it. Thank you, everyone. All right. I heard it called the coup. I don't know. Maybe that's just corny old dad. Anyway. <laughs> Who would I? Um, I want to introduce my Uncle John Braybock really quick um, just to say hi and um, we'll keep going from there, but he's going to be a huge part of this. Originally, I thought it was going to be me taking on this big topic, but at the same time, I'm just really part of, proud of the young people that are part of this as well. Um, Ayi, Luis, uh, Rosa, uh, everyone, um, for, I don't, don't want to forget anybody, but um, this is a collective thing. We're doing this together, and now Uncle John gets to be a part of this too, so maybe um, just give everybody a chance to really quickly introduce themselves. Um, the facilitators, that's what you guys are. Um, going around starting with Uncle John. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Uh huh. Um, <clears throat> I'm John Bravehawk. I'm from Rosebud, South Dakota. Uh, I've been here on the West Coast uh, a little over 30 years. Uh, I'm a Sundance chief. Uh, I run a Sundance in Rosebud. Uh, I'm a medicine man. I run a bear dance in California. So uh, I'm here in Portland uh, trying to get people to be sober, uh, drug free, uh, find their paths and uh, move straight ahead. I did foster care for about 13 years. Uh, now I'm working with the, the parents of these foster kids and hopefully, you know, we can make a better tomorrow. All of this. <clears throat> land acknowledgement and, and it's knowledge, it's wisdom. It's something that every indigenous person should know, but for some reason we don't. So the more you learn, the more you know, the better you can teach the children. So do everything, learn everything and then enjoy your life. So it's good to see all of you here today. Aho. Oh, thank you, Theo. Uh, Rosalina, you mind going next? You've been such a big part of this. I know you're kind of background, but just introduce <laughs> yourself real quick. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Rose Mendoza. Um, Hello. I'm the one you've been getting all of the emails from. <laughs> I'm the program coordinator here at CCYLC. I've been here for about two years now. Um, happy to see all you guys here. That's it. <laughs> Jair? Thank you. Jair? Hi, uh, welcome to our like fifth session already. Fourth, fourth session. Thank you, Russ. Uh, I'm Jair, the one in charge of the slides, and also the one that did the land acknowledgement. I'll pass it on to whoever wants to go next. And Alma, can you go next for us, or Luis, or any one of the other? Hi, everyone. My name is Alma Melchor Burgos. Um, I'm an intern here. This is going to be, I think, my first year. Uh, yeah, going on to the second year as an intern for the CCLYC. Um, and I'm just happy to be here. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Luis. Um, I'm, I've been an intern for uh, Clark County Latino Youth for about two years. Um, I also help out in the sessions. I've been, I've had the honor to um, be the host of some of the, of one of the sessions. So I'm just excited to be here and I'm really happy to see all of you. Hi guys, my name is Sam. I'm she, her, a, yeah, pronouns. I have also been part of CCLYC for about a year, almost two. Um, and I'm really excited that all of you guys are here. So thank you so much for coming. All right, giving space for folks that don't want to introduce themselves, but I've been working with just an amazing team and we put this thing together and I'm just so proud to be able to share this. 
Um, and now Uncle John joining us. This is going to be a, a full production for all of you. Um, we're we're going to be touching on a really important topic, uh, but also a kind of a heavy one. And I think it's really important um, to remember that I'm just a, a, a regular person. I, I'm, I'm no one special. And with that said, I want to know, I want to share with you that what I've done in times of um, like high stress and when these kinds of things come up is I refer to my elders, I refer to the ancestors, I refer to the ways of the traditional uh, um, Chanupa, the red road. And so for me, I get to heal and I get to grow by doing all this. And, it, and it's a, a journey that um, is really, really special to me. So I, I want to acknowledge the ancestors and also acknowledge you as human beings, you as spirits. And I want to offer all of you a song because today you're going to not only just be here to listen, but I'm actually hoping that you're going to participate, that you're going to give a little bit of yourself into this project. So I'm going to offer you something from my heart to yours. And all you need to do right now is open up your heart, open up your mind and just really listen. That's a, a gift. We can't shake hands, we can't hug, but that's a, a spiritual hug. That's a, a gift that I can give from here to all of you. And um, yeah, that to me, that's again, following those traditional ways. When I get stuck, when I get lost, I just remember one of the most important things they always say, you never ask for anything without giving something first. You never ask for anything from the earth, from one another. It just sets a tone. It sets a new way of thinking and being so that you never take too much. And I always remember that when I meet new people and if I'm about to ask them to be a part of something, I always give that piece first where I'm sharing with all of you. So now that we've done that, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about what is that um, intergenerational uh, trauma. And so I'm going to uh, hand it over to Alma as, as she does a little reading for us, uh, a little bit of information sharing. So hi everyone again. Um, so yeah, so the session this uh, the session is going to be about intergenerational trauma. And so what is it? Um, it's an, a traumatic event that began generations prior and continues to impact present generations. The trauma experience can affect an individual, multiple family members, or collective trauma affecting a larger community, cultural, racial, ethnic, or other groups and/or populations. Effects could include a range of psychiatric symptoms as well as a greater vulnerability to stress. Trauma that is experienced can also affect the way an individual understands it, copes with it, and heals from it. Some examples of how trauma can affect generations could include a fam family might see discussing feelings as a sign of weakness or just seem hesitant to start the conversations. Families might seem anxious and overly protective of their children or family members, even when there is no threat of danger. Um, these are just some examples. Uh, there's a variety of them, you know, and everyone experiences them differently. Uh, but one thing that is certain for everyone is that these conversations need to start happening. And that's why um, I'm glad that we had this session today because, you know, sometimes it's hard to find a safe space to start talking about these. And so I'm just thankful that we were able to get this session going and that we have Rodolfo here and Uncle John to start these conversations. So again, thank you for being here and yeah, enjoy the session. That's a lot and that's that's pretty heavy. And I guess I'm, I'm just curious if anybody's 
feeling brave enough to share uh, maybe just with a, a thumbs up on your on your uh, uh, reaction there has anybody experienced intergenerational trauma is this something that any of you can relate to uh, I know for me it, it was something that I didn't even know in, in, for many years uh, I carried this machismo thing and in my thinking growing up it was how men protected women and I had a lot of learning to do around that and so it's one of these things that um, I feel like it's what the elders say is that you've got all your life to learn keep on learning keep on learning keep on learning because once you're done learning it's time to go home you're done so keep on growing keep on learning that's what this life is for so even though I'm not perfect, and even though I still got a lot of growing to do, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate the, the growing and learning. Um, so yeah, just also being here together, witnessing with one another, knowing that you're not alone, um, that we're all feeling these things. Uh, I'd love to put a name on it for everyone, but it's different for everyone. It hits every household differently. So again, it's like, how do you take on this thing that's so big, right? Something that's gone on for generations, right? Well, the beautiful thing is, is that on the flip side, for generations, the elders have been talking about this too. There was a, they call them a prophecy. They say after seven generations, after the hoop has been broken, after all this madness that happens, it's going to be mended again. And what does that mean? It means back to balance, back to harmony. And who's going to take us there? It's not some rich person. It's not some government politician. It's going to be the young people and the elders. It's going to be the generations that show us the way to the future. And so that's why we're here today. And that's why it's important Uncle John's here too. Because as a, I'm the adult, but you are the spirit of moving forward. I can't do it without you and I can't do it without Uncle John. And right now, me, the teachers, all the adults here, we have that responsibility. What kind of life do we want to create for our, our children? So hoping together we can heal and grow and understand. And then we're going to share some things that have helped me and some things that have helped Uncle John. And we're going to do something that's going to open up a little bit of your mind to seeing how simple it is to heal and grow together. But at the same time, it's just an honor to be here with everybody. So thank you. Uh, moving forward, I'm going to ask you guys to start uh, pulling out your art packets and doing all that kind of stuff. Uh, have you guys already set up? You guys got your um, colors and your waters. And let me just say, as we start moving into this part, I want, cool, I want um, you guys to remember to put down a piece of plastic, like a, uh, a store-bought bag, or even a piece of, uh, like a, a paper bag from the store. But put something down beneath it, because you don't want to let paint see through and get on, on the table or whatever you're working on. Um, very few of us have painting easels and stuff like that. So yeah, just take care of your surface. And then from there, have a little bit of water on the side so you can keep throwing your brushes in there. And if you wanna use a certain brush, you can keep on using it. Okay, and um, I wanna make sure that everybody kind of knows which one we're starting with. It's gonna be the first one that we're gonna start working on is gonna be the one that has some squiggly lines on it. It should have some stuff already uh, on it. And then there's another one that's totally blank, right? We're gonna start with the one that we work together on. Any questions so far? So what I need to do is go to the, I have two stations. I have another one where I'm going to be doing some painting, uh, like showing you guys demonstration. So I'm going to get over to that camera. Give me one second here.
All right, can you hear me? Yes. All right. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Here is my first piece right here. You see some of those lines right there. And I'm really just going to get us started because once we get started, I'm going to have Uncle John start doing some uh, sharing, some storytelling, something relevant to what we were just talking about. Um, but before we do that, I want us all kind of just starting to flow. So we, we've got our, our surface uh, covered. We've got our first piece that we're going to work on. Next, pull out, I'd say the darkest color you've got. And of course, you, I gave you all li uh, really light colors, but I mean like the darker tone. So more like a, a purple instead of a light green, more of a blue instead of an orange. Pull out one of your colors. And then I want you to pull out one of your brushes, nothing wide, nothing too big, something more like a line. You know, I, I've been doing this piece, this the community piece for too many years. I, I don't even know, uh, but I just want to say that this is going to be really easy, guys. Don't feel at all intimidated. Um, for me, part of the joy of what I do is that it's so easy for everyone and everybody can enjoy it. And really, quite literally, there is no messing up. And if you've gotten the chance to paint with me, I would show you by painting over something that I started to paint just to show you. And um, it, it, for me, like corrections, it, it's learning. Um, and sometimes even the things that you think are mistakes even turn out to be beautiful mistakes. So um, just try to relax, make sure that you're enjoying this, that you're not stressing yourself out. Uh, take your time. Um, there's no rush. We've got plenty of time. We're going to be working on this one for the first part, but then we're going to work on a, on a different piece. And if there's more time, you can always come back to this. We can always work on these afterwards. I'm going to give you guys enough time to work on them at home uh, because the ultimate goal is that we're going to come back and we're going to put some of these together and it's going to make one giant beautiful piece. So uh, yeah, just try to enjoy it. And any questions while we're painting, go ahead and just ask me. And if, uh, if Uncle John's talking, maybe put it in the chat so we know that you, you've got a question and then we'll respond. And as I'm talking, I'm not really checking the chat. So um, uh, Jair, Rosa, if you guys just can let me know too. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start with the demo. I picked my darker color, my thinner brush. And all I'm doing to start is I'm gonna go ahead and outline the color. I mean, the color, the line that's already there. So let's just start with outlining the lines that are already there. And if you don't have too many lines, that's okay. That just means you've got a different part of the mural that it's not going to have that much uh, on there. And that'll give you actually a little more freedom later. So starting with that. And as we go ahead and move into that, taking your time, I'm going to go ahead and keep on working on it. After I'm done outlining, I'm going to just start filling in with color. And as I start to fill it in, the same thing applies. Relax. Don't worry about it. It doesn't have any method, any madness, you are freestyling it. And that's what we want. At the end, what I usually do when I do paintings, I'll put a color or two on top of them to make it all come together. But I love a variety of colors. So whatever colors you end up choosing are going to be fine. We're going to do a, after the outline, we're going to do a fill. And then we're going to play around with a little bit of technique. But I'm going to be doing it in front of you guys while Uncle John is sharing story. So uh, we're getting to 528 now, and I just want to check back in with everybody. Are there any questions so far? Does anybody need anything before we get started here? No questions? OK, so we're good to go. Um, I'm going to start the demo. And Uncle John, Phil, if you can uh, do us the honor and share with us your, your wisdom. I hope. Uh -huh. Uh, uh, while I'm speaking, if you have any questions, uh, that's good. Uh, 
let me know and I'll try and answer whatever I can. You know, I've, I've learned that art is, uh, is an expression of feeling. What you feel inside your mind, uh, inside your body, inside your, your walk in this world is what you express in, the, in your art. The, the better expression you have, uh, the better your art will be. Uh, when I was growing up, I came from a, a totally different world. You know, I, I was raised by my grandparents in the country. We had no wa uh, running water. We had no electricity. Uh, when it got dark, we went to bed. And when the sun came up, we got up. Uh, it, was, it was a different world. Uh, money wasn't involved. Uh, we, we harvested, we grew uh, all our own food. Uh, I think the only thing we bought in the store was kerosene and toilet paper. Other than that, you know, everything we, we harvested from, uh, from where we lived. Um, when I left that and came to the West Coast, uh, I couldn't speak English. Um, <clears throat> it was really hard to identify with all these different cultures and different uh, ethnic groups. I didn't understand them. Uh, they were different. Uh, life was very hard for me. Uh, up until I was five years old, uh, I had to go to school at five years old. So I had to have a name. I didn't have a name before that because I wasn't born in a hospital. I was born in a beet field. My mom was working topping beets when she delivered me. So I didn't have a name. I didn't have a birth certificate or social security number. Coming to the West Coast, I had to obtain all those things. Uh, I had to go to school. I had to learn English. Uh, growing up uh, in the early 70s is when I became active in the American Indian movement. Uh, the people then were, were uh, fighting uh, to express themselves. They were they were fighting to have a voice. Art is the, is the same thing. You, you are voicing your expression on canvas or on paper. Uh, this is a different battlefield. And this is a different way of, of, of uh, expressing yourself. So during, during the, the uh, Wounded Knee occupation, uh, many things uh, were, were brought to life. Uh, a lot of things the government were doing, a lot of things the tribe were doing. And the difference was that the people were tired of it. They were done with it. And they wanted the American Indian Movement to do something. And we talked about it, we talked about it, and we decided there's really nothing we can do except to accomplish something out of it. And if we could just get a voice, just be able to talk and talk to somebody that, that meant something. And so we did, we occupied Wounded Knee and uh, our sovereignty was at stake at that point. And when we got a voice and we had a, a right to say something, to have an opinion in this world, uh, it changed. Uh, a lot of things. And so today we are still here and we still have our sovereignty and we, we have a stronger voice now uh, with which to express ourselves. So the more and more you, you, you learn to do that, the more you develop your mind, develop your voice, you can uh, show that in your art. Um, I've watched uh, <clears throat> a couple of workshops with Rudy and I'm, I'm always astonished by all these scribbles on the wall, how they turn out to be something. 
And, you know, uh, I did a mural with him, or I helped uh, my son and Rudy and Andreas and a few others. And, on, and by, by the end of the day, it, it looked like a, a big mess on the wall. And I knew what it was supposed to be, but it, it looked nothing like it. And after we all went home, Rudy came back and he did the outlining, what he's talking about here, just do the outlining. And when he did that, everything came into focus. You could see the, the artwork, the picture, and what it was trying to express. So when we came back next day, we just filled in the colors and, you know, stuff like that. But he has become quite the artist. And it, it really uh, blew me away to, to see him develop an expression that uh, we all uh, had a hand in doing. That, that mural started on my kitchen table here in my house and uh, ended up in a, in a park. And uh, very, very, very awesome artwork. So I encourage all of you to, to find something that, that you're interested in, if it's art or uh, whatever it is, to learn, study, and, and do it. Uh, because time, time uh, doesn't stop. It goes on and on and on. And someday uh, you'll be wishing you did those things. And uh, don't, don't waste your time. Do everything you would like to do in this world. And, and do it well. If you make mistakes, then don't call them mistakes because they're not. They are learning experiences. Uh, the native, native world, you know, we didn't have books and we didn't have schools. The whole Mother Earth was our school. And so we learn by doing. So if you did something that didn't work, that wasn't a mistake. It was a learning experience. It's only a a, a mistake if you did it the second time and you know it doesn't work that way, you do it again, then that's a mistake. So uh, stay on a positive note and uh, wake up in the morning and, and, and smile first. Don't think about yesterday, think about today. What can you do today to to, to make it a better day. In the morning, when I say my morning prayers, I always ask for help to help me to help someone else this day, even if it's just one person. And if there's nobody, then uh, help me to, to help myself become a better person. So every day it's wake up on a positive note, uh, a smile and, and a prayer for a good day. And uh, when I'm at almost done with my prayer, and then I, I, I ask for forgiveness and for yesterday's mistakes that I might have made. But uh, yeah, every day is a good day. Uh, a long time ago, because of what was going on, uh, people used to say, today's a good day to die. And that's because that's the way it was. But today it's no longer that. Today we say it's a good day to live. So do that, live, wake up in the morning and, and be full of life, fresh life, and be ready to live. Learn, learn to live and, and don't, don't worry about the other stuff. I always try to teach my kids, you know, be thankful for what you have and never mind what you don't have can't change it anyway. So accept, accept it as is. And, and if you want it different, then make it different. That's your prerogative. So anyway, uh, Rudy's about running out of paper there. He's coloring on the table now. So I'm gonna uh, turn this over back to him and see what he wants to do now. Anyway, thank you all. And you're all good students. And uh, have a good day. Aho. Appreciate you, Theo. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like I, I introduced him to you all like he was, you know, someone everyone knew, Uncle John. 
um, he came into my life as uh, the local community Sundance chief where I was at a point in my life where I, my family, they're, they're very Mexica, they're very uh, much uh, Mexican people. And so uh, for them, they, they're Spanish speaking, they're Catholic, they're very much, you know, the, the way we say um, people here are Americanized, uh, in Mexico, they say, um, you know, they call us pochos um, because we're different. Well, Mexicans, you know, as far as considered, like, in comparison to indigenous people, like, uh, indigenous people speak a different language. Um, like, even the Aztec Empire before um, Mexico, that was Nahuatl. That was a language that uh, several tribes spoke. And then tribes specifically, each tribe speaks uh, Purepecha, uh, Mixteco, uh, Maya. Uh, there's so many, you know, that um, to be really, you know, like Mexican, it, nowadays it, it's this new version of what it means, but our roots are our roots. And um, no matter what we try to say we are today because we want to be a reflection of today, we still have a connection to our roots. That connection drove me mad. I knew there was something there and I knew I wanted to find it. And it happened to be that when I first put that intention, that prayer out there, I found a Kojan Bravecock and he was doing Lakota style from South Dakota, from his family, from his geography over there. Um, I hadn't found anybody Mexica. And I don't know, at first I thought, man, is that is that an accident? Was that, we might be doing the right thing, but Uncle John, though, it felt right in my gut. It was the intuition. It was my spirit told me that this I needed to stick with this guy. And we didn't even talk much at first. It was more the ceremonies. Every ceremony was just more powerful than the next. Every time I came to do a ceremony with Uncle John, I would heal tremendously. And what I'm referring to is the Native American practices of the, the sweat lodge. They they call it a sweat lodge. It's an awful word for it. It's a prayer lodge. It's just really tied to uh, the earth. So there's elements of uh, heat and darkness and earth and um, medicines like sage and cedar. Um, but this is something that you can do here locally, really close by. And then there's more involved ceremonies, like the Sundance ceremony. He's also a chief to that. And he started getting me off that uh, kind of, we call it the black road. I'll be honest with you guys, after the Marine Corps, that's my background. I, as soon as Chicago, I got Chicago out of me, and I got the Marine Corps out of me, I, I started feeling like a human being again. And that was thanks to this man. And so um, it, my life turned around because of this work that we're doing together. And that's why he's here today. And um, I'm just really happy to have him here. And it always makes me feel a little more, gives me a little more courage, you know, but um, also that I know that I can show the full picture of what I'm talking about. And um, now I do it with young people. He's inspired me to go work at the juvenile detention center where we started the first sweat lodge ever in Multnomah County there. And um, we do other things, but the beautiful thing is, is that work of like, that I started with Uncle John led me to my people. And I'm also part of an Aztec dance group where we do our ceremonies that we do from back home in Mexico. And not just the Aztec dancing, but also the peyote ceremonies, the temascal, which is just like sweat lodge. These are all traditional ceremonies that we did to help ourselves live in a good way, to heal from our uh, whatever was going on in our lives. And without those things, we're, we're kind of like trying to do what we can. And uh, I feel like I did that stuff. I went to church. I went to therapy. I did all the things I was supposed to, and I was hitting a dead end. And then when I got on my knees and I prayed and I asked for something, Uncle John showed up. I was so intimidated. I didn't talk to him for about a year, but I kept on going to ceremony. I was thinking either he's going to kick me out or he's going to like me one way or another. I'm not going to say nothing to mess it up. <laughs> Eventually, <laughs> he, uh, he did. He talked to me and um, it was in the lodge. And I'll never forget it. And, you know, that's the beginning of that that work for us. And now I get to do it with all you guys. And, and I get to do it with young people that have gone through things that I've gone through really hard and it's this thing that, you know, it, I couldn't have made it up. It, it's something that the ancestors have insisted on for so many years. They call them the virtues of the pipe. 
to live with generations, to think of the and uh, to think of the elders and the young people as we move forward in life. That, that's that's perfect. So um, going back to the the art stuff here, um, how's everybody doing? Is everybody feeling good? Any questions? I see some people instead of be working. I just took a pause for a second, but okay. So everybody's feeling like they got a nice roll going. Okay, so I'm gonna keep on working, but I'm gonna start sharing a little bit of my story now as um, we move into uh, the, the this other piece. And um, I'm I've got some slides for for after the break, but. I actually, I just want to share a, a simple story. It's one that comes from the, the Aztec tradition, which interesting enough, the Aztecs were the empire that was here before, you know, when the Spaniards came and they took Mexico. But um, before them, they actually took a lot of their culture is, is rooted in the Toltec Chichimeca culture. And these stories are usually a lot older than just the Aztecs. The Aztecs were what, 500 maybe 700 years ago, the Toltecs were like uh, over a thousand years ago. And so these stories are, are pretty old. And the ones when I hear them, that they touch my heart, I love to go out and share them with folks. So um, I'm going to share that story as we keep on working on this art. If you have any questions, just let me know. The importance of stories and storytelling, it's, it's not just taking back that power and saying, I am the storyteller, I create my narrative. But it's also, it's beautiful because you get to share it with people. And so it becomes this thing where it's not just about yourself. And I tell you, I, I, initially, I thought I was going to be all by myself working in a studio as a studio artist. I'll share that story in a little while too. But um, I am so happy that this is what happened because of ceremony. This is what happened because of Uncle John. I wouldn't have even thought of trying to come up with a way to paint with community members if I didn't see the sweat lodge. I remember one of the first things I heard when I was there, I was kind of sitting there waiting for instructions or something. I don't know what I was thinking. I was just sitting there and then somebody said, hey, what are you doing? This isn't a spectator sport. In other words, everybody participates. And I was like, yeah, everybody should participate. If you're together, we should all be doing this together. And so my artwork, it started with that idea. Like, how do we all do this together? And that's why large murals, large artwork has always been so easy because I could bring groups of people from 10, 20, uh, 40 people together, easy street blocks. One time, I, two times now, three times, actually, I've been those outdoor street murals and it's a whole neighborhood. It's a block party. So it's just a great way of bringing people together. I'm going to ask you guys to open up your minds and again, and think about something uh, very different than what we're used to. Think about a time before there were any people on the planet. Even science says that we didn't evolve for a long time. For, so for millions of years, there was nothing here except for the developing plankton and um, everything that was evolving to become something. But for the spirits, for the spirit world, there were a lot, a lot going on here. The spirits were here and the spirits, all the spirits, the spirits of the, the spirits of the feelings that we all have, the spirits of the animals, the spirits of the elements, all the spirits were there and they were alive and they were living and they were uh, kind of just, you know, enjoying what, what we have here now. And then one day, one really special day, the creator came and he asked everybody to come forward. That there was something special that the creator needed to share. And so everybody gathered. And the creator said that today was the special day that the people were coming. And since the people were coming, it meant that there needed to be a great sacrifice. And the only way that the people would come is if two of the spirits would make that sacrifice for them, for all of the people. 
And so at first it was very quiet. No one responded. No one wanted to sacrifice. No one knew what that even meant. So they were quiet, just like us right now. And then finally, Vader says, please, we need you. We can't do this without you. The people are coming and they need you. And this time a different voice came out of the crowd. A quiet voice said, I'll do it. And the crowd moved over looking for that voice and they found the little goddess, each chin. Each chin said, I'll do it. She stepped forward in front of everyone and everybody surprised. Creator took her hand, shook her hand and walked her over to the ledge. Beyond the ledge were the eternal flames. Then Creator turned around and looked at the crowd, said, we need another one, another volunteer. Please come forward. And this time a different voice rose from the crowd. It was a loud voice, a boisterous voice. Get out of my way, move it. It was Huitzilopochtli, the warrior spirit. Of course, it's going to be me, you bunch of cowards. Get out of the way. Huitzilopochtli takes his hand, shakes his hand, thanks him, and walks him over to the ledge and turns around and says, because of these two spirits, the people will come and we give thanks to them today. And at that moment, something happened to Huitzilopochtli. He felt something he had never felt before. And all of a sudden he says, wait a minute, maybe uh, maybe somebody else should do this. You know, not that I'm afraid or anything, just, you know, who's going to protect all of you? You need me. And in his fear and his panic, a little hand reached out to his and the little goddess grabbed his hand and she showed him what he was missing that courage with a simple smile. She smiles at him and he smiled back and they both turned around. They looked down, looked at each other and they jumped into the eternal flames. One shot out one direction, the other shot out in the other direction. One making the moon, one making the sun. This is the story of the sun and the moon. Yeah, I love those stories. I, I love the, the story of how the, the little goddess just like, I don't know, I feel like the little goddess sometimes. Is that funny to say? Especially when I was a kid, you know, like I, I was always that quiet courage. I was always, I felt like a, a brave kid. I just wasn't the big mouth, you know, like I could never be like the tough guy because I was kind of small, but I would never back down. You know what I mean? <laughs> But those stories are meant to say a lot of different things to different people. And they're told in different ways because everybody's different. And they're meant to be that way. It's okay. Before the Spaniards came, we had thousands of libraries all over with these, filled with these, we call them codices. They weren't scrolls. They were kind of like accordion books with all our stories, all our artwork is the first thing that got destroyed. So we come from that. We come from that greatness. It's just taken from us. So whenever I can, I, I try to pick those up and put them in my, my database, uh, uh, my old brain, and share them the best that I can. And I just hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, but moving forward now, uh, I just want to kind of start playing with a little bit of technique with you guys. Um, it's, it's something that uh, a lot of times... Most of us know how to paint just regular. We, we've all filled in space. We've all done fill work, you know, since little kids. And um, there's even coloring books. That's fill, right? Well, using technique is a little different. Uh, you start kind of playing with your brush in a different way. You start using different colors in ways that you haven't used. One of my favorite things that I picked up was what Uncle John was talking about, that big mess that you see at first. Um, I love to see like an explosion of light and color. And then I kind of bring it back with, uh, they call it volume. That's the fancy word for shadow and light. And that's how things kind of start looking more real again, not just like these floating colorful things. Um, but what we're going to do now is we're going to take, uh, you know, right here for mine, I have yellow down. I'm going to use purple, which usually when I can, I play with the complementary color 
And that's yellow, purple, red, green, orange, blue. I like to do these things where you use the complementary color and then it messes with people's eyes. And it's nothing fancy you got to do. It's really just the colors doing the work for you. So one of the techniques that I, I've used at first, I was a big fan of Van Gogh kind of going with those little lines. I was really into his little uh, kind of the faces and the clothing, everything had, they call that texture. And he used these little lines, right? Well, back in Mexico, uh, the Huachire, the Huichol, the tribe of my family, we have uh, what's called uh, the, the alebrijes. I think you guys have seen them probably in uh, Coco and they're the spirit animals and they're really colorful. Well, the way we see these is through that peyote ceremony. It's not just a peyote ceremony. It's a ceremony of uh, harvesting of uh, family because little ones, grandparents, everyone participates. It's not just the adults. This is a, a family thing. And then when they're doing that medicine, they're making connections with their spirit and they're connecting to the spirit animals and their ancestors. And that's where you see that really colorful art. And um, that's where I got this other style that I like to use. Um, it's just really simply dots. And um, as, as uh, simple it is, as these dots are, they're so awesome because they do a lot of things. They kind of like uh, create texture uh, in their own way. Like if you use the brush really slow and really careful, you can make like what I call like a Hershey's kiss or like a little uh, volcano. And then when it dries, the light, the way it hits it, it creates shadow and a highlight that you can't get from just flat painting on a brush. I mean, on a surface. So there's these techniques that are just a lot of fun um, to play with that are really simple to do. So again, just taking a brush, and going up and down, uh, lots of paint on your brush. And you guys don't feel like you have to save the paint. You guys use it all up as much as you can too. So I showed you a couple of different ways to do that. Either going kind of up and down or side to side. I also like what's a lot of fun too. Hey, Rodolfo, there is a okay. question on the chat. Okay, let's see. Um, if you don't have a lot of lines, do you just do whatever with the background? So what, what I want you to do if you have if you don't have a lot of lines is just do a fill that you really like pick your favorite color, maybe a couple colors. If there's some kind of uh, uh, some kind of line, then um, work around that. But yeah, you don't have to do anything fancy. Just fill it in, fill in the whole thing with color. And I think uh, how are we doing on time too? It's 5.57 right now. So when were we going to take our break? Oh, sorry, I was muted. Probably around 6. We're going to take a break. Okay, so we'll keep on working on this for the next couple of minutes. Start uh, ramping down. And again, um, I was going to share another thing that I really like is um, I do a lot of swirls and it's funny because like all these things, for me, the dot, I started to realize the dot instead of the line is very feminine. It's a circle, right? And the line, of course, it's very masculine. And then I started playing with these, uh, these spiral things. And I was like, where is this coming from? Because I really like them. And I started putting them in my water and stuff. Even that is related to like nature. There's, you go find a shell, uh, you go find a uh, fern, you go find all sorts of things in nature. They're going to have that spiral in it. You, just your hand, there's a spiral right here. And so again, even though they seem very simplistic, these, these little simple patterns repeated next to one another, they're, they're just great for uh, creating like these, these great optical like visuals. And again, like I said, you don't have to do much. You can just keep it really simple but because it's the two different kinds of colors. And the more colors you put on, the more fascinating it is. But of course, it's all about time. And um, usually 
you don't have that much time when you're working on something small like this because it starts to get really wet and once it gets really saturated it's just messy and you start whatever color you started with it starts to become brown so you don't want to do too much anyway right now with something this small um like i said just be finishing up we still got like one minute to finish up um what else uh yeah i was all excited about the spiral lately because i just found that um all of those have meant something to me for a long time i did a lot of those little lines and um now and then it was those dots and then it was a fusion of the two and then the spiral started showing up and all of it art is so such a reflection of the person it's such a reflection of you everything you're putting down is is you you know so when we put these all together which is exactly what we're going to do we're going to come up with something that looks amazing that that represents uh not only um something aesthetic something that looks nice to the eye but also a symbol of what we can do together and i'll share with you guys when we get back from break what that looks like um i should have shared that with you guys before we got started but yeah um either way i got you when we get back so let's go ahead and take a little break now uh when we come back uh we're gonna do some more artwork we're gonna switch it up we're not gonna work on the same one but uh, go ahead and use the bathroom, stretch your legs, uh, get some more water, whatever you need to do. I'll be doing the same. And in the past, I didn't really make a, <laughs> a, a grid in the back, but I learned from my mistakes. So I put a grid back there so that when we put it together, it'll come back together perfectly. Uh, Eli's probably wondering why I didn't figure that out before. But everybody got like a one by one square of this. And when we get them all back together, what I'll do is I'll kind of tape them together on one side and then uh, tape them together on the other side and then I'll paint them. So I'll, it'll be all one complete piece and then that'll give it its, uh, con your, its continuity. So it all looks like it's part of one thing. Even though everything's gonna have different colors and different effects, it's all gonna be still the same image. So thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, can we put that the screen down now or the image down? Great. Okay, so then, um, as we put those aside and kind of shift gears a little bit, um, you know, that art is also healing. It's uh, something that, it distracts us from whatever we're going through, but it also sometimes if it's uh, compelling enough, it, it helps us with what we're going through at the moment. And sometimes it's just being able to express ourselves, get some of that feeling out. But I'm, I'm glad you guys got to be, be able to enjoy that for a little bit. Next, I want to invite another young person to boldly share their story. Uh, we're talking about something very delicate here and, um, it's really hard to, one, just get up in front of people and talk, but also talk about your personal stuff. At first, I, I think I was ashamed of all the hard things I went through until I started to realize that it was even for a reason. And there's some pretty bad things, you know, and I'm convinced now it, it was for a reason. And more, most of that reason is because of you guys, because the young people, I realized that it, there's something to learn from that. And the young people... They appreciate it when you're honest and you can tell them about that stuff. So my life is an open book now. I, I, you can literally look up my, my life on YouTube. You'll find out all about it. But um, it's, it's, a, it's a big deal. So I just want to thank Luis for uh, having the courage to come up and share a little bit. And uh, yeah, if, if you would, Luis, take it away. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you, Rodolfo, for introducing me. Um, I'm just going to be sharing a quick short story on um, what generational trauma has meant to me and um, what it has, I guess it's sort of my pers my perspective on it how, and how it's affected um, not, not just me, um, but the people around me. So I hope that from this story, uh, you're able to learn something new about uh, what generational trauma is or something 
um, that you can relate to and and understand that gen generational trauma not only uh, affects us but the people around us. So um, I'll begin. <laughs> Um, I must be honest and and start uh, by sharing that I I I couldn't find in myself any sort of generational trauma past from the general sense of what generational trauma is. Um, I couldn't find any kind of generational trauma that was passed down from my grandparents to my parents and then to me. But this isn't to say that my parents didn't suffer from it, uh, especially my dad. Um, my dad is older than most dads I know. He's around his 50s, so he's old. He's pretty old. Um, and as I've gotten older, our bond has grown a lot to the point where I can tell him anything and trust him. And at the same time, he has also opened up and told me about what his life was like um, before me and my brother or my mom. And I mean, a lot of these stories are about his life as a, uh, he was a truck driver. Um, so a lot of these stories are about his life and the job and him running into all sorts of situations. And, and a lot of these stories are fun to hear um, and very interesting, but uh, other stories are more personal and show sides of him that I never knew existed. Um, from what my dad has told me, uh, my grandfather wasn't a very good parent to him. My dad uh, loves and respects his dad because he taught him how to work and how to support a family financially. Um, but when we talk about it, that's all he's able to tell me that my grandpa taught him. That was it. Just how to work and how to make sh how to uh, have a house for a family and how to provide for them financially. Um, when my dad was 12, his parents sent him to the city to live with other relatives. And from then on, my dad was basically on his own. When he tells me this, I can feel the emotions behind his words. I can feel that he's still upset that they left him on his own. And I can feel the anger and the sadness towards his dad because he never showed any affection towards him. This affected my dad deeply, and sometimes when he tells me these stories, he chokes up. I think it's because it's a wound that never fully healed, so it still stings. Um, my dad was married and had a family before he met my mom. And in recent years, uh, he has told me, and out of my own curiosity, I've asked, and we've talked about what his life was like at this time. And... When I hear him talk about this this the, this period in his life, it's like if I was hearing a story about somebody else, somebody completely different, nothing like the dad I know. Like his dad, he was also very absent from his kids when they were entering the teenage years. Um, it has been more than twenty years, and his his kids still resent him for it. Uh, two of him don't speak to him, and he doesn't reach out. And my dad doesn't reach out because he knows he hurt them. And when we talk about this, I know he would like to fix his relationship with them, but he, but maybe he doesn't know how to. Or maybe a part of him knows it's too late to heal the wound. Here I asked myself, how is it possible that the same dad who has shown unconditional love and affection to me is the same dad that this happened to? If he would have been his first family, would he have treated me and my brother in the same way? I don't think my dad has fully healed from these wounds, and I don't know if he ever will. But I think that he realized he didn't have to raise his children in the same manner his dad had raised him. And I think that's what changed him to, into the dad that he is today. And he has cared for me and my brother, and he has protected us since we were born. And I am eternally thankful for that. My dad has shown me that it's possible to change and break patterns that have shaped us into who we are. And I hope that you were able to realize this too. I hope that you can understand that a lot of our parents, maybe yours in this case, have been dealing with these cycles their whole lives. 
and maybe some of them don't know how to break from it. Unfortunately, I don't have the answer for this, but I know that the first step needed to break to break from these cycles is to realize to realize and accept that you might be in them. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, Luis. That was great, man. Uh, and you got me thinking about my family. That was beautiful. Thank you, man. Thank you for sharing that. And you got me crying over here. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah, you don't have to always hear them say the words, but you feel it. Well, I think this is a perfect time to segue into that second piece of art making that is going to be more about your story and about your experience and what you want to share with us. I think we have a lot to think about in regards to how the generations are being impacted by this history that we've had to endure for so long. With that knowledge, um, thinking about our, our parents, our grandparents, how can we move forward in a good way, right? It is really, really powerful, guys. I got to say, Luis, that was really, really great, man. You got me feeling. You got me feeling a lot. I was going to share a lot anyway, so it's, it, it's okay. That's what this is all about. Uh, but I'm feeling a lot, and uh, that's a good thing. Um, I'm going to move over to the next screen just so that I can get you guys going on the art piece. Uncle John and I are going to still do a little more uh, sharing, but I'm going to get you set up for the next piece really quick. So give me one minute. Uh, and while he's setting that up, I do want to remind everyone to please go ahead and drop your emails in the chat so that way we can get you guys your EF cards. Um, I also dropped in the link to the permission slip if you guys can get your parents to fill those out. Um, part of it is the uh, photo release so that way we're able to share this recording with people who weren't able to attend this meeting. So if you guys could do that, that'd be great. Can I just add, um, once we receive your permission slip back, um, that is verification to send your e-card uh, to you. So we will not send an e-card until we get your parents' permission slip signed um, back to us, please. Thank you. And that was Diana Avalos. Thank God for Diana. She's the one who got us all together and made this happen. Um, she's the, the, the magic person behind the curtain. So uh, thank you, Diana. Oh, we're, you're welcome, um, Rudy. I'm just very grateful um, that uh, for your friendship, and very grateful and indebted uh, to you for your leadership and commitment to helping us all be better human beings. Thank you so much. And also, and also to our elder, uh, John, who's on the call with us as well. Thank you so much, sir, for your words of incredible wisdom, um, very grounding. Um, my most deep heartfelt appreciation for your words, sir. Thank you. You're very welcome. <clears throat> Thank you, Diana. All right, so uh, we're, we're moving into, like I mentioned before, the reflection piece. And what does that mean? It, it's more about you. This is a chance to kind of use art as a, a way to go in and, and share. And really, it doesn't even really have to be uh, anything literal. Uh, if some people are actually very literal and, and they want to use a word to express themselves, feel free to do so. What we're going to do with these, um, these are going to be like an exterior border for the artwork within the, the collaboration art that we did. That's going to be in the middle. And then your individual pieces are all going to be the border for the outside of it. 
So this is all you. This doesn't have to be anything um, around the design. It doesn't have to do anything with any of us. This is all about you. Um, and Uncle John and I are going to go ahead and uh, just share while while we make uh, while you guys make some art. And I, I ask you to think a little bit about what uh, Luis was sharing uh, in regards to that uh, generations um, piece that uh, it, it's it's elusive, right? But uh, it's there and um, maybe you don't know too much about it, but this is a great way to start. And maybe you do, you do have some feelings around it, but you don't know how to put the words on it. Well, that's what art's for. Um, I feel like sometimes my art, when, when uh, you get really close to it, you can really see some amazing stuff, but um, it's, it's a great way of like just letting, laying down a lot of paint. And so there's a lot of energy and sometimes I'll be done and I'll be sweating. Um, it's also a, a cathartic. It just feels great to make w wild, crazy art. So do whatever you want with this. This is more about um, you and your experience. Um, so I, I feel like I've given you that freedom now and I'm going to be playing around after I um, get done with my piece and Uncle John starts doing a little story telling, but um, Jared, can you put on the, the presentation again? Yeah. Which slide would you like me to go to? Go that, to? One's, that one's perfect. Okay. You know, my family, I think I mentioned, comes from Mexico. Uh, my mom's um, grew up and lived in, in Ciudad Juarez. It's uh, notoriously terrible right now. Um, it's been for a while, Juarez. But my dad was actually from uh, Guadalajara. Uh, but I, it's crazy because like the, the real roots that I discovered were closer to Zacatecas, which is where my grandmother was from. Um, my family went a long way from home to try to find um, better conditions for, for themselves. We ended up in uh, Chicago, not because uh, they had any awareness of it, just because they had a padrino who lived there, who already had a job lined up for them. And that, of course, is the most important thing. And so my family, they came from Juarez um, to Chicago. And Chicago, ooh, I was born, <laughs> my, most of my siblings were born in Cook County Hospital, which is like the, the hospital downtown. But I was, my mom told me that I was actually born in a Catholic hospital right next to it, uh, where they didn't use any uh, uh, pain medication. And so... Uh, she said that it was always I was always her hardest baby coming out, <laughs> but uh, Chicago I feel like it was just that for everyone. Uh, on my own family, we suffered from not only extreme poverty, and um, I could tell you the stories from the roaches in the cereal to the uh, buses just to get to the grocery store. Um, it, it was hard, and then my own family going through the domestic violence drug addiction, alcoholism. Um, we were really suffering. Uh, my grandfather di died of a stroke at 50 something, pretty young. My grandmother, not too much longer after that. Um, but my family's uh, really, really struggled. And, and for them, this idea of Chicago was an idea of hope, which in spite of what it brought us, you know, um, it is what it is. And so I always share that piece because I, I think Again, it's important that we know that the grass isn't always greener on the other side, but also this is where that generational piece comes from. Like, um, they're just trying to do the best for us. You know, sometimes I, I would get really angry at my parents for getting us to Chicago because it was rough, guys. And I would remember they're trying and they didn't mean to make us make things bad for us. But like gangs, corruption with cops. I don't know if you guys have an officer friendly here that comes to the schools when you're little and uh, tells you, you know, say no to drugs. Like, man, that guy was smacking us around as kids. and It was rough. But it was my family trying. 
in Chicago, as bad as it was, it was still better than Mexico, Ciudad, Ciudad Juarez. Like I said, it became a cartel uh, uh, spot. It, it's a nightmare, Juarez, even though they still have a house there. You know? Next slide, please. So um, for me, the, the Chicago kind of took everything it could from me. I ended up homeless at like 15, 13 years old. Um, I had nowhere to go. I ended up in uh, a boy's home. And from there, I just left for the Marine Corps. I, I had no other family or choices. And I thought in my head, I saw, I grew up around gang makers. My cousin Freddie was in a gang. And I remember seeing this one guy they said, you can't get out of gangs. You don't get out of gangs. You get beat out. That's it. And you don't get out. And so this one guy, he was even like a leader of the Pee Wees, and he got out by joining the military. And so I was like, I don't know. It wasn't even that I was in a gang. It was just like it's, I saw a way out. And I remember that. And so come 18, I knew I couldn't go back home. I just went to the Marine Corps. Um, but it was, again, like part of what, what made me my who I am. Um, knowing that it wasn't what I wanted to do, knowing that I saw too much, that I was too aware of our government and what we were getting involved with, I left. I quit after my four years. Not to say I didn't try to get kicked out before that, guys. I wish I could say I was clean whistle. No, I was getting into fights with people and all sorts of rowdiness. But it still turned out. I just finished my time. And then after that, I was still insistent that I had more to give. And I started striving for social justice, working with homeless people, working with homeless kids. And so the Chicano community pulled me in. I started working with the Chicano community as a mentor and then uh, an advocate working with families. Um, and that's kind of what, where things kind of started to shift for me was when at the same time I found Uncle John and that I, I had a, uh, not only a purpose, but I also had a spiritual practice. And so I lined them up and it became my work. Um, and then that led me into the art. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and start doing a little bit of artwork and I'm gonna let Uncle John take over here. Um, like I said, he inspired everything that I did from the detention center to the mentorship with gang impacted kids and whatnot. We created different organizations to do the work we're doing. He has. Uh, an organization called Medicine Bear, and I have the Redstone Collective. We're both part of each, so we're both on each other's organization. But um, we're, you know, we're working to try to like help uh, heal that and and mend that hoop. But I'm gonna let Uncle John talk a little bit more about that. I'm gonna make a little bit of art, and I want to make sure we have enough time to let everybody share out at the end as well. So timekeepers, make sure. Um, you got a time check right now? What time do we got? Uh, 6.30. Okay, so we're gonna make some artwork for about another 10 minutes. Uncle John's gonna share for about another 10 minutes. And then we're gonna stop and we're gonna share some artwork. Whoever's feeling bold wants to share. Um, and if not, it's okay. Uh, we're gonna also close it with, uh, Uncle John's gonna do a closing prayer for us. and. Um, we're getting close, guys, but let's go ahead and focus now on the artwork and uh, Uncle John, if you can take it from here. Uh, <clears throat> uh -huh. uh, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, share some stories uh, back in, in, in the early 70s. Uh, this is when my life uh, kind of took a path. Uh, <clears throat> wandering around, uh, I was on, I've been on my own since I was 16, but uh, wandering around with, you know, my brothers and relatives trying to figure out what to do. Uh, we ended up in the West Coast and my relative here, uh, who was trying to uh, bring the Sundance ceremony to the West Coast, uh, they asked me, he said, uh, I need your help. And I, I told him, I said, well, what do I got to offer? He said, well, it's a Lakota ceremony and I need Lakotas. And I said, yeah, I'll go, but I'm not sober. He says, that's a matter of choice. 
um, make the commitment and just just do it. <clears throat> so um, I met a medicine man, an elder from Eagle Butte, uh, several elders here on the West Coast, and we proceeded uh, to 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 make a commitment and to to uh, to offer a new way of life. So in the process of that, uh, I met people uh, like Frank Pulscrow, um, Pete Catches, um, Joe Flying by some of these elders that that uh, kind of set the way for spirituality and culture and tradition uh, for, for, for the generations to come. So as I met these people and I got committed, uh, I also got sober. Today I have uh, over 40 years sober, drug-free, uh, because of the commitment I made at that time. Uh, this commitment involved being sober, being helpful, being as traditional as possible. And uh, with permission from Frank Fulscrow, with guidance and instruction from, from the elders at that time, we brought the, West, we brought the Sundance to the West Coast. Uh, my uncle ran it for four years at Mount Hood and I ran it the second four years at Mount Hood. And then my path just took off from there. Uh, there was a time when I was uh, running five, five sun dances a year uh, for, for a medicine man. I was just a helper then. Uh, after about 18 years of doing that, I finally learned that this is what a Sundance chief does. He runs the Sundance. Uh, I found out also that traditionally, the, uh, the, the Sundance chief ran the Sundance and the medicine man just came there and did doctoring because it was a ceremony and that's where the people were. So he would doctor at that time. So, uh, I ran this ceremony for 18 years for, uh, for the people here. Uh, today, this year, I ran my 80th Sundance in Rosebud, South Dakota. I don't know how long I can do this, but it's become a way of life. It's become not a choice, but a way of life. And this is a choice I made long ago, you know, when, when the elders, the, the, the spiritual leaders asked me for help and, and to be worthy of that help, I had to be sober, I had to be drug free. And, and uh, this is, this is a, a culture, a tradition that, that uh, alcohol has no place in our culture. It, it destroys it, it destroys everything. So you have to be alcohol free in order to do this. So uh, my life changed and, and uh, it's not so much of a, of a physical battle as a spiritual battle. And, and the, the closer I get to God, the happier I am. This month, I will be 73 years old. And, and I'm so honored and grateful to have lived this long. I never expected this. But I think because I kept my word, I prom my promise to God, and I'm still sober, uh, I think for that reason, I'm still alive. So life is, is, is a form of art. You make your life how you want it. And, and this is, we learn this as we get older and older. But uh, my regret, my only regret is that I waited so long to, to do what I'm doing today. And uh, they say four years of sun dancing, you're a sun dancer. 
but I think it's not four years. <laughs> it's just a start. Uh, it's a, it's a, a way of life that you live and, and you sun dance until you can't dance anymore. And uh, uh, I danced this year, uh, all four days and I'm very thankful. I don't know if I can do that next year or ever again, but I'm thankful that God gave me this much in my life to do. So find out your path, find out your direction and, and your skills. You know, God gave everybody a skill. Every one of you have a purpose here in this world. And, and, and you find that purpose, you find that skill. It will make you so happy and so productive in, in your walk, in your journey. Uh, I run community sweat lodges here in Portland. Uh, I run a sweat lodge in Dono D. Hall Juvenile Detention Center. I, I run sweat lodges in Walla Walla Prison and OSP uh, all over the West Coast. This is uh, a Lakota ceremony that I run because I am a Lakota. I cannot run a Navajo ceremony or a Cheyenne ceremony. I can only run a Lakota ceremony because that's what I am. So uh, learn your roots, learn your skills, learn your purpose on this earth, and it will make you a productive, happy human being. They say that when we sweat and we sun dance and we carry a pipe and we make these commitments that people think that it makes you a good Indian, but that's not it. It doesn't make you Indian at all. It makes you human, the way God made you. He made us all human. He didn't make us Indians or white people or black people. He made us human. Let's get back to being human again. So uh, that's where I am today in my walk in this world. And I'm very honored that God gave me this much. I have eight children who are all grown, uh, 38 grandchildren, and uh, about 16 great-grandchildren. So yes, uh, I've lived a very happy, productive life. And I'm still here and hope to uh, live some more. So I encourage all of you to learn to live uh, through your art, through your skills, uh, through your walk in this world. And when you die, it's not over. Only this world for you is over, but you will move on. And uh, you know, they say uh, you came from the earth and you will return to the earth. So when you, when you leave us, you know, we're going to dig a hole and then throw dirt in your face so you can go home. But your spirit never dies. It, it moves on to the spirit world. And then you live that life. So that's the, the medicine wheel. That's the circle of life going around and around and around, on and on. So this is only this portion of your life. You are here to live. So learn to live. And with that, uh, I'll, I'll let you go for now. Aho. Thank you. Thank you. Are you really going to throw dirt in my face? <laughs> I guess that's just how it goes. All right. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, Everybody kind of see what I got going here. And um, for me, something that always comes up in my artwork is the tree. The tree um, represents that connection from this world to the next, the, the spirit world. Um, the tree also ends up a lot of times looking like the four directions. Uh, that's what I got here. I, I felt like in my life now, I've, I've been sun dancing long enough now where every four years it's a different prayer. And um, this time it's very clear to me that I'm praying for uh, the, the children, for the young people, and I'm praying for the medicine wheel. And so this image keeps popping up in my life a lot. Uh, 
Um, but that's that's me sharing and um, you know Sundance for me, I've already brought in a couple of young people that have started to kind of think about it, look at it, consider it. Uh, it's a big deal. And so uh, to have people come into the sweat lodge community is kind of like uh, training wheels, kind of like getting started if they're interested and uh, to see people become sun dancers and pipe keepers. It's really beautiful. Um, it's uh, an honor to be a part of all that. So I love sharing and um, all these things are just so significant. And I know that for my, in my life, like it, it gives me clarity and purpose and I get tired like everyone else, but um, I know exactly why I'm doing what I'm doing. Uh, not a lot of people can say that. Uh, but it's this, uh, this journey that we're on. So anyway, with, you know, that was my little spiel. Um, I'd like to ask somebody to bravely share um, if they're, they're willing to. Just if you want to just share the picture or if you want to share a few words about it, that'd be nice too. It'd be nice if the students shared, but I can always pick on the interns, so. <laughs> okay, well, we're gonna go around then. I want you guys to show me what you got. Put your camera on and just put your there's one. Oh, that feels so nice. That's like there's pastels in there. The cool and that kind of warm coming together. Thank you, Persephone. That's beautiful. I want some more of my people. Let's see some of your artwork. Let's see what you got. You don't have to say anything. Let me just see it. All right, there we go. Aileen, I, I love it. The rainbow, the warm. Yeah, that's beautiful. Who else? Anybody? have something that they'd like to share or a reflection that they'd like to talk about something that came up while we were sharing our stories while we were talking about the topic it's a heavy topic i'm blaming you guys yeah i'd like to uh <clears throat> add something to rudy's story if i may um our sundance ceremony uh, evolves around a cottonwood tree that is called the tree of life. The reason for that being that if you cut the branch in the center, there, there's a star. That star represents the morning star when the moon is waning. That's a certain time of year, a certain time of the month when the moon and the sun do that. And when they are close together like that and the moon is waning, that's the Sundance time. And we, we, uh, we take a tree, we take his life and we bring his spirit back to the, to the campgrounds. We prepare a hole in the ground and we stand that tree up in that hole with the spirit still alive. We, we put spirit food, spirit offerings and many many prayers up there in that tree and we dance with that tree sun up to sun down we pierce our bodies to that tree we spill our blood and tear our flesh we make many sacrifices along with this tree that gave his life for us so the connection to that tree of life is so very much alive in every Sundancer in one form or another. And right here, right now, you can witness that this tree of life is alive in the form of art in, in Rudy's mind. So that's a connection 
a spiritual, a cultural connection that, that brought him to, to his skill, to his art. And, and it's still there, the tree of life, the tree, life, all of these things represent us. Why, why are we here? What are we doing here? What are we supposed to do here? Well, you're supposed to live. God put you here to live. And everybody's life is different. We all live a different life, but it's called life. And so many of us spend so many years killing ourselves with anger and jealousy and, you know, uh, chaos and drama and all these things that, you know, they kill you. They kill your spirit. They kill your, your, your mental power, your physical being. They make you sick. These are not natural things. God didn't create them. We did. These are man-made that's why they kill us. So all of these connections you can make during your path here only make you stronger. And, and uh, you know, I see that not, not only just today here with Rudy, but with many of my dancers, many of the people who, uh, they come to me to, to be sober, to, to, to go in a sweat lodge, to purify, to pray with a pipe. Uh, they come here and bring me tobacco all the time and pray for this and pray for that and help me with this and help me with that, you know. And I, I, I can tell them, you know, I can help you help yourself, but I can't do anything for you. You have to do for you. And I, I encourage them and I help them to do that. Uh, you know, when, when, I, when they come to me and ask for help, I don't look at the person uh, today, I will see you, but I will not judge you until four years from now. I will give you four years. At that time, I want to see a different person. I want to hear a different person. I want to know that you are a different person. And after four years, I will know that. I will see that. And it's obvious that you have done something positive, something good and that I helped you do that. So in my walk, in my path, you know, helping anyone uh, is, is what I live for. And that helps me to have purpose. So uh, yeah, keep on keeping on. I hope, mijo. Thank you, Theo. And I, I wanna share too with everyone, like when it comes to these uh, profound spiritual things too that I'm talking about that I'm referencing that uh, at one point I thought it was just in books and I, I got excited about when I saw it in movies but it did not live around me they're accessible to you guys we're here for you that's what Uncle John does the community uh, ceremonies for so you guys can be a part of it that's why we even go out of our way to find the kids that are in trouble at the detention center to make sure that they have access to this you if you wanted this, if you wanted something like this, whether it's Uncle John and me, or whether it's the Aztec dancers, uh, there's different groups too. Uh, you know, there it's out there, and they're so tied to our heritage that just in trying to learn about it, they call that uh, learning about culture. But if you learn about your culture, now you're doing that generational healing. Now you're going back and changing what happened in time where we were robbed of our libraries and our knowledge and our wisdom and these ways, you're coming back and taking it back. So be brave, be bold, put yourself out there. If you are wanting something like that, something like this, reach out to me, reach out to Uncle John, reach out. I know that there's Aztec dance groups out in Vancouver too. I've worked with them, but my groups are out here in Portland, but I've worked with groups from all the way up to Seattle, down to California, they're everywhere. And those are the Mexicas, where it's like over a thousand tribes in Mexico alone. And that's like what they are. They, they just, they do that ceremony because that's one of the ones that's still alive. That's one of the ones that maintain, just like the Sundance. You find people of different tribes up here that they're not necessarily Lakota, but they're doing it because it's one of the ones that was maintained. It was illegal here for into, up until the 70s. So it was all underground. And so the ones that stayed, those were powerful. And that's why we cling to them because we've, we don't have them. And they, in turn, 
help us as we help them do their ceremonies they help us find ourselves and uh, nobody ever says uncle john never said i'm going to teach you to be like me i'm going to teach you to be a lakota the one thing he did say he's going to teach me to be is a human being god and that's what we can share so put that put intention out there put that prayer out there um uh, we're here for you it's here for you it's just hard to believe sometimes and i think that's part of it faith is really not just believing in the great mystery but believing in ourselves please believe in yourself i believe in you guys i know we ain't all got to figure it out but there's so much goodness in, in all of us here and i believe in that so we, with uh, five minutes left i'm gonna ask one more time if anybody wants to share anybody wants to feel you know feel a little uh community love and share their artwork maybe not even say anything just share your art Last chance, last chance. I mean, I'm going to see them all anyway. <laughs> if you guys want to share right quick. Oh, Diana, you're, you're muted. Diana, you're muted. Oh, I always. <laughs> always. Um, how about this? Um, let's challenge ourselves a little bit. Let's be a little bold out there. I know some of you have already shared um, your paintings, um, your art. Um, so thank you for that. Um, how about let's challenge us all to turn on your cameras and um, put your put your artwork like in front of you like this if you don't want to be seen on camera, so that um, we can take a picture of it collectively. Um, and then you can turn your cameras off, and then we'll be done. How does that sound? <coughs> Sounds good. Oh, look at that. Thank you, Vanessa. Whoa, look at they, the uh, Oh, I love Belcher. I love that. Oh my gosh. Sam, beautiful. <gasps> beautiful. Yasmin, that's beautiful. Oh, I love those circles. And Angela, Whoa. thank you so much. You're making an old lady here very happy. <laughs> <sighs> oh, I have some screenshots on my end too. So <laughs> I can't see. I can't see the small fonts. All right, go ahead, camera. Valentin Valentinia, that's beautiful. beautiful. Oh, look at that! That is it's awesome. Fun. And Pablo, gracias. Thank you. That's beautiful. Look at all you courageous leaders, just yeah. just just stepping up and sharing. I love it. What a way to end the awesome, uh, what a way to end the evening. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate all of you for do for being courageous. All right, friends. Well, we're getting close to our uh, closing, and um, I want to send warm appreciations to everyone who helped make this happen, everyone who participated, uh, everyone who's here with those good intentions and trying to uh, help yourself and help your family and help your community heal. Um, thank you for keeping an open mind and uh, letting this old man share his insights and his stories and uh, for having the respect to listen to my Uncle John and um, everything to all of you, um, sending you guys all a big spiritual hug. And with, uh, with that said, uh, you can always find me on Instagram, Rudy Redstone Serena. I'm also on Facebook. If you guys want to keep on uh, doing stuff in the community with me, reach out to me. My cell phone's on there too. Um, but yeah, yeah, we're here. Uh, Uncle John, can you close us with a, a closing prayer, please? Come on. Uh, I'm going to ask all of you to join me. Uh, when we speak to God, it's always better that we all speak the same same words. It means more. Uh, I'm just a common man. I'm a nobody. So uh, if you join me, then he might listen to me. So let's pray. Aho tunkashilate wa kontonka. Katia topa na wambli galeska kuta na uchi namaka wa huedo. Unkashila lakota hukshila mecha. O banata hiu meto kashila unshikela po. Unkashila leho chukak tomniska ichi awakan. Le 
chanu pasapa wakho mita kola iktob nikai cha na wagamoha ihamani wopila hecha wopila chicha o god great spirit creator i thank you for this day in our lives i thank you for the good things you give to us and i'm so sorry for the mistakes we have made forgive us for that and help us to make a better day today for a better future tomorrow watch over our children and our elders and our medicine people guide us in our journeys god that we find our way in this world feed the homeless the sick and the elderly and all the single parents who are struggling with their children aho tunkashira aho mitakoyasi amen thank you